All right, I gotta say, today I am quite happy to let you know I think Enshrouded is a very good game. I've been playing pretty much nonstop this past week and still can't get enough. In fact, I have every intention to keep on playing after this review goes live. The game has just totally sucked me in, taking me by surprise with the sheer size of its world, variety of locations and enemies, great feeling combat, and an overall high quality of content across the board. Uh, this is exactly the sort of survival game that I have wanted for some time. It has all of the basic survival features with gathering, crafting, and building, but what is really at the forefront is a heavy emphasis on exploration, discovery, and classic fantasy RPG elements, all of which has left me regularly feeling similar things to what I felt playing games like Valheim or Skyrim. And no, I'm not saying that Enshrouded is just like those games, it isn't in many ways, but rather that the sense of discovery and desire to keep on exploring that it creates is very much along the same lines. And for that reason alone, I've been loving my time with this game. Now I'm gonna talk a bit more in detail about the things I like and also the things I dislike and could use improvement, but first I wanna give you a rundown of what Enshrouded is all about to give you just a clear picture of what the game is. Now officially they are referring to this as a survival action RPG. You start off waking up with nothing but a pair of shorts and are asked via the main story quest to go out, gather resources, and begin construction on a base. Although even right from the start, things are open to be approached as you please with a nearby cave system and ruins that are begging to be explored. Now doing so will introduce you to combat in the game as you take on a few basic enemies as well as rewarding you with some loot and consumables and this rewarding of exploration is a theme that continues throughout the game. Now eventually you'll start gathering some stones and you'll have the materials needed to build your first flame altar. These are essentially plots in which you can construct buildings. Now base building in Enshrouded consists of all of the expected elements you able to place foundations, walls, columns, and stairs, first picking a structure type and then what material, be it wood, stone, or whatever else you'd like it to be made out of. Now after placing your first flame altar, the main story takes you through a series of steps basically introducing you to some key elements of the game. First you are asked to rescue an NPC, specifically the blacksmith. He is trapped inside of a nearby vault. Now once saved, he can be summoned at your base and grant you access to new weapons and armor. Then after that you are guided to an elixir well in which you must make your way underground while fighting back enemies and dealing with the ticking clock of the enshrouded mechanic which functions sort of like an oxygen meter. Once you locate and destroy the shroud root at the base of the well it will lift in the nearby fog and allows you to freely explore. Then next in the main story quest you're asked to locate a few nearby flame sanctums and shrines. Activating these rewards you with resource used for upgrading your base and then you're tasked with ascending an ancient spire. This is a massive tower high above everything else in the region. Upon finding the entrance, you will climb the tower by engaging with many different forms of jumping and other puzzles. Making your way to the top rewards you with loot and unlocks a new fast travel location. Now, these four objectives remain pillars of the rest of your playthrough. Locating NPCs along with doing quests for them, clearing various shroud routes found in elixir wells and elsewhere, activating flame sanctums and shrines, and ascending ancient spires and other major points of interest. These aren't the only four activities or things to do, but they are definitely the most frequently reoccurring ones. Now, after you've gone through the first initial steps, how the rest of the game plays out is really entirely up to you. You will be asked to continue exploring the world and completing tasks related to progressing the game's systems, mainly tied to finding new NPCs, unlocking further crafting and building options, and upgrading your flame altar, which is a main roadblock in progressing into the later stages of the game. How you do any of this though, the pace at which you progress is totally your call. This game features a massive world, and I mean huge, and it is loaded with points of interest and places to explore, which if you want could very well sidetrack you for tens or hundreds of hours before making any significant main story progress. And that isn't even accounting for the base building as well, which could also easily add up to many, many hours, even just in the early stages of the game. The point of which is, there is a lot of content, a lot of things to do, a lot of stuff to 
fill your time when playing in Enshrouded, and I'd like to go over some of these various aspects, starting with the world and exploration. Now, as mentioned, this game is tremendously big, but unlike many survival games that opt for procedural world generation, Enshrouded is static. All of the terrain, every point of interest, the items, puzzles, and boss locations, everything about the world in this game is the same for everyone. Now, initially, I wasn't sure about this, but after playing and just seeing the size of the game, I've actually been fairly impressed with the variety of things to see and do. These include settlements from massive towns with tons of buildings, cellars, and towers to humongous castles. In settlement locations, you'll usually find one distinct faction of enemies and then also lots of loot and sometimes bosses to fight. There are dungeons of various kinds with different names like catacombs and sun temples. These are usually longer, more extensive excursions, and besides fighting enemies, will include some form of puzzle solving, traps to avoid, and also a boss to fight. There are outposts. These are smaller camps, most of which we've seen have either had bandits or zombies in them, as well as a mini boss. Now, so far, we have counted around eight unique bosses found at these camps, some of which are reskins with different sizes and difficulties. There are also things like buried tombs. These are sort of mini dungeons. You'll usually actually have to mine or break away rocks to access these. They tend to consist of a couple of rooms and a treasure chest at the end. And then there are many, many, many various smaller unnamed areas, camps, farms, caves, and ruins, tons of different locations you'll come across while exploring the world. And while in these locations, you might happen to be on quests that, you're got, that you get from NPCs or from the main story quest line, but you will also very frequently come across pages and scrolls on the ground, which uncover a bit of lore and typically also point you to new points of interest and locations on your map. And this is besides just natural exploration, another thing that really fuels the discovery and exploration. And that is on top of all of the other points of interest, those main pillars of points of interest that I mentioned earlier, those ancient spires, the towers you have to climb to the top, solving puzzles on your way up, the ancient vaults, which is where you go to unlock NPCs. Typically, these will be full of enemies and things for you to do. There are the elixir wells, which are like tiny delves that are underground. You have to kill the shroud root to clear the area. Sometimes there are bosses there. There are just lone shroud roots that can be found all throughout the world. You'll go and destroy those those to clear the fog. And then there are the ancient obelisks. Uh, these are like information towers. When you come across and interact with one of these, they will give you the exact location of every specific type of point of interest. So maybe you find an obelisk that will show you where every shroud route in the immediate area is located. And all of these points of interest, all of these activities pepper the landscape, which consists of several different biomes. So you start out in the specific region with rolling hills and sparse trees and, uh, you know, little mountainous areas. But then after that, you venture into this dense woodlands area. Eventually, you're guided towards the desert and eventually the mountainous region as well. Progress to these areas are not just gated by enemy levels because higher level enemies are extremely deadly and you don't do a lot of damage to them, but they are also gated by the fog or the enshrouded areas as the game's name is. So beyond the different biomes, the game is further divided into two sections. You can think of it as the highland areas where you are able to freely roam without restriction, but then there are just as many lowland valleys and ravines that are all engulfed in this thick fog. It's almost like they replaced water with fog. These are areas that you can walk around, but in limited duration. Because anytime you enter an enshrouded region, what is more or less a breath timer starts ticking away, giving you a limited amount of time before needing to quote unquote come up for air. This creates a sense of urgency while exploring these areas, as you'll either need to leave the fog before the timer reaches zero, because if it reaches zero, you are dead, or you'll have to search out various things like hourglass capsules or flame altars, which can instantly replenish your time. There are also things like potions and gear that can be used to extend the amount of time you can spend in the shroud. And this system all across the board creates a really nice push and pull while exploring these specific regions of the world, the enshrouded areas. Uh, overall, I would say that the shroud makes up about a fourth of the total play space. Uh, you'll enter these regions frequently, but it's not the only thing you'll be doing. You'll spend much of your time in the higher land regions, periodically going into the shroud to clear the elixir wells, to clear shroud routes, and to uh, accomplish the objectives of certain quests. But most of the playtime 
is spent above the shroud regions. Uh, exploration in this game with all of this stuff coming together, I have found incredibly enjoyable, especially when coupled with all of the movement potential with things like a double jump, you have a grapple hook and a glide. There's the fact that the world is made up of voxels that can be destroyed, letting you make little nooks in a hill, allowing you to more easily climb your way up or letting you break through walls or, or roofs. Like this definitely isn't a game that has one clear definitive path for you to get to point A to point B, no. This game has tons of freedom of exploration and coupled with all these systems and the diversity of points of interest, all the different locations and the biomes, throw in the shroud system into the mix as well. Uh, exploring in this world has just been incredibly enjoyable and satisfying. I really, really like it. Now let's talk about NPCs and the crafting system. So at the very start of the game, crafting is done on the go. You've got field crafting where you're able to make the basic tier one tools, weapons, armor, ammo, torches, bandages, etc. You then will learn how to set up a workbench after making your first flame altar. This lets you build additional tools like traversal items. You can make your glider and grappling hook there, along with a ton of different base building related stuff. But then after that, everything comes from NPCs. These not only open up new crafting options, they also help towards general progression in the game and also feed into each other, especially when you get to late game. For example, certain NPCs will require parts from other NPCs in order for you to create things. Now, all NPCs will have tons of different quests. First, you're asked to find the blacksmith, as mentioned earlier, and he will have several quests for you, examples of which are, he'll give you a quest to find the next NPC chamber. So after the blacksmith, you're asked to locate the alchemist. You'll also get quests from him and the other NPCs to go to different points of interest to collect loot and rewards, pointing you to catacombs, towers, sun temples, and all sorts of areas where you'll get some sort of loot. There will be chain quests that take you to a few different locations on hunt for a rare tool, which will then be used to upgrade that NPC's stations or unlock new crafting facilities. NPCs will also give you hints on where to find new resources, occasionally actually pointing to their exact location on your map, because as you move through the game's different biomes and you progress like many survival games, they introduce new versions of ore, new versions of wood, uh, new consumables and collectibles, and just new, new resources for you to gather. And other various points of interest will be pointed out by your NPCs, granting rewards such as new weapons, glider or grappling hook upgrades, new building blocks, and plenty of other useful stuff. Now, generally speaking, here's what each of the NPCs in the game do. So first there is the blacksmith. This is the initial guy you get. He introduces you to the mechanics of uh, crafting basic metal tools and weapons, as well as armor. As you upgrade the blacksmith, he gets much better and stronger weapons and armor. The second NPC you're asked to find is the alchemist. This is pretty straightforward. He is used for making various potions and other ingredients to fuel the other crafters. Then there is the hunter who is used for making various hides and paddings. You can make tons of different arrows as well as some hunter or stamina class specific sets. After the hunter, you're guided towards both the farmer and the carpenter. Now the farmer is probably one of the most important NPCs because uh, she allows you to turn any plants into seeds and then you can take those seeds, farm more plants yourself, basically create a bountiful harvest. Uh, this becomes especially important late game where resources are rarer. Also the farmer gives you access to various cooking apparatus can do simple things from cooked meats, but more complicated dishes, soups, and even sandwiches. And then the fifth and final NPC is the carpenter who is used for making planks, storage, and lots of decoration, which plays into the comfort system of base building, which then moves us on to base building in the game. So this is done using a tool called the construction hammer. You equip it and then it lets you enter build mode. Here you're presented with various template options for constructing a base, the foundation, walls, windows, doors, columns, ceilings, floors, stairs, etc. The game gives you various size options. You can place one by one and up to four by four variants. Place them however you want using whatever materials you've discovered so far. So you start with wood and then move into various forms of stones and metals. The game does also have terraforming, although I haven't personally used much of it. Uh, you can use it to manipulate the terrain. Probably the biggest thing with the base itself though, beyond being a place to store your NPCs and all of the various crafting stations, if is the comfort system. This is a super important element of the game as it provides a massive buff to your stamina, increasing your max stamina as well as the stamina regeneration. So you raise your comfort level by basically put, putting certain items inside of your home, usually all sorts of different decorations. Now this starts out, you get a comfort buff. It d gives you that boost to stamina and stam regen, but at the very beginning, it only lasts a few minutes. Eventually, once you get enough comfort items and a high enough level comfort items in there, eventually it can last like, uh, we're about an hour now total of the comfort buff when we're back at home. And it is such a big boon getting that increased stamina and the regen that we're 
typically if we ever die or the timer runs out, we're porting back to base to get that comfort buff because it's so helpful while moving and exploring. And then also at your home, besides trying to raise its comfort level and doing all those other things, you have got that flame altar and you'll be upgrading this because as I mentioned, upgrading it is vital important towards later game progression. Upgrading the altar not only does things like increase the area in which you can build your base, but it also unlocks the ability to place new flame altars. So these will be used either to make additional bases, but more so we have been using it for fast travel. There are two places that you can fast travel in this game. You can fast travel to those towers that you climb. Once you reach the top, you unlock a fast travel to that location. And you can also fast travel to your flame altars. And you can have many of these as you progress and level up your base flame altar. It lets you place many more flame altars around the world. We just use these as mobile fast travel locations. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the game's various progression and RPG systems. Um, there's quite a lot in here. So first we've got the gear, weapons, and items. The game has various gear slots for you to fill. There's helm, chest, gloves, pants, and feet. There are also accessories like your grappling hook, glider, two ring slots, and a backpack letting you store more. The gear comes in various sets. These sets will come with bo uh, bonuses that sort of tailor towards specific play styles, whether you're focused on melee, agility, or magic user. There's also weapons in the game. Now these come in different rarities. There's white, blue, purple, and gold. There are some base level items that you'll get various rarities of, but then there's also special unique named items that always come in gold, and these are highly, highly valuable. You'll definitely be searching for these because the higher rarity a weapon is, the more number of upgrades with each one of those upgrades bumping its level, but also granting additional uh, passive buffs. So you get more damage, you get new stats like increased crit or life leech or mana leech, all sorts of different abilities. And then there are tons of different items like any survival game. You got a bunch of consumables. It kind of uses a Valheim inspired buff system where food is going to give you useful bonuses like increasing your stamina regeneration, health regeneration, your maximum stamina, your maximum health, boost to the amount of time that you can spend in the shroud, giving you increased crit chance, all of the expected stuff that you would expect from any survival or RPG game. And also the game is full of tons of different resources that fuels into the crafting systems, the woods, the stones, the cloths, the ores, salt, bone, herbs, all of those things. In addition to the gear, looking for weapons, looking for various gear sets and gear that has the stats that you want, there's also a skill tree. So you acquire skill points either by leveling up with a cap of level 25 or by clearing shroud roots, which will also grant you additional points. And then you spend those points in the skill tree. So this tree is fairly large. It's spread out into three primary sections, basically broken up into a focus on melee, ranged, and magic. There's also three different node types, which I'll call major, medium, and minor, three different sizes. The major nodes, the biggest nodes, grant entirely new abilities. These include things like the ability to blink, the ability to do a jump attack or a double jump, and then all sorts of abilities tailored to the different play styles in the game. In fact, they have rough archetypes in the skill tree that give you a general idea of the class fantasy that is fulfilled if you head in certain directions. These go tank, warrior, barbarian, athlete, survivor, beastmaster, ranger, assassin, trickster, wizard, healer, and battle mage. Now you have to keep in mind there are only so many skill points in the game and you can't get every single skill node in the skill tree. So you are going to have to make decisions. While I was going through my playthrough, I was primarily focused on a melee build, a sort of like a warrior slash tank hybrid, while also going a bit into the survivalist, I'm um, sorry, the survivor area, because I wanted to go in that direction to get access to the double jump, which mind you, pretty vital. I would say double jump is a skill that absolutely everyone should get in the skill tree, which is actually probably one of my biggest complaints about the tree. I do find it fairly interesting, but some of this stuff feels like it should be baseline. I think double jump is a great example of that. Everyone should have double jump as because it is such a massive disadvantage to not have double jump when it comes to trying to navigate this world. Outside of those major nodes, you have got minor nodes, which will add strong but useful buffs like flat percent damage increases for the various types of melee ranged and spell attacks reducing resource cost of abilities, doing things like pacifying nearby wildlife or increasing rested buff duration, reducing the amount of wear and tear on your tools, uh, lots of useful abilities from these medium nodes. And then the smallest nodes will give small stat buffs, but these definitely stack up to be very strong over time, especially if you get many of them. And these will mostly increase your attributes, giving you more health through constitution, more melee damage through strength, agility, stamina, intellect, uh, again, all of the standard RPG stuff. So that is a basic overview of the major systems, features, and content 
in and shrouded. Now I want to talk a bit about what I love and what I think could use some work. Right out the gate, I gotta say, hands down, my favorite thing about this game is the world and exploration. I just think exploring in Enshrouded feels so incredibly good, specifically the varied ways, the many different ways you can approach situations with all of the traversal options, which include the ability to climb ladders and stairs, the ability to double jump, your grapple hook and your glide, using that in these various types of terrain, using that on any of these points of interest and locations, you can pretty much approach any obstacle, be it navigating the world or getting into a location or getting to a boss or getting your way to a treasure chest in absolutely whatever manner you want. There is so much potential here for like creative exploration in the world that I really love. And that is just made that much more interesting by the varied amount of objectives, of points of interest, of locations. It just feels like a rich fantasy world that has just been incredibly enjoyable to explore and spend time in. And I love all of the freedom that you have while doing that. Couple all of that with the puzzles that there are to solve, the jumping puzzles, but then also just straight up uh, just puzzle puzzles. And with how big the world is and all that variety of content, I just I really can't say enough how much I have enjoyed exploring in this game, how much of a positive to the overall experience it is. It, it's one of the main selling points for me. But also the second thing that we really haven't talked much about so far, but I got to say, I think the combat is extremely well executed. Now it is a very simple system. It isn't terribly complex. You only have a basic attack initially, but then over time, as you get more skills, you unlock the ability to do more things mechanically in combat for, for a little bit more skill. But even with the basic attack, the block and parry and dodge system, even at the base, it feels really good. It feels very satisfying. And then you start mixing in the different type of attack options with the melee, the ranged and the magic spells, which everybody can use. It doesn't matter what build you're going with. You can use melee, ranged and magic, and you should use all of these things. Combat has been really, really enjoyable. I found the progression system to have a lot more depth than I expected. Now the skill tree is what it is. It's pretty straightforward. You just spec in a direction, right? But you can go in multiple directions. You can go battle mage where you got a little bit of warrior and a little bit of mage, a little bit of healer. I mean, I don't have to explain all of the different potential directions and hybrids that you can do because the skill tree, like I said a moment ago, it shows you all of those different sort of archetypes and roles that you can fill. But specifically coupling that with the different sets of armor, with all of the different boost and bonuses they give to the various play styles, whether you want to go tanky or aggressive, whether you want to want to go uh, stamina focused, uh, magic focused, or melee focused, or tank focused, or any mix in between. There's a lot of potential here for basically expression of the player, uh, uh, RPG class expression. And the last big thing that I've just really appreciated and enjoyed it in this game is its co-op. Now I've played probably about half of the time solo, half co-op. I've enjoyed solo just as much as co-op, but there's so much extra fun that can be had while playing with people. I know that is generally the case for pretty much every game, but I think especially in this game, it seems almost like it was built from the ground up with co-op in mind. In fact, they support up to 16 players per server is the number. And um, I think that's probably a bit too much. I'm happy with somewhere in the vicinity of three to five uh, for my play sessions, but nevertheless, co-op, if you can do it, if you have friends who are playing, I definitely suggest giving it a shot. Now, like I said at the top, as a whole, I really like this game. Um, it's definitely one, I, I know it's not saying much because it's just the end of January now, but it is one of my favorite games of this year so far. I mean, <laughs> It sounds ridiculous because yeah, we're only a month in the year, but I, I really, really like this game. I'm definitely going to keep playing it after this review, but nevertheless, I do have some points of feedback and critique here. Uh, starting off, I think the game balance could use some work. Some enemies are just significantly harder than others, particularly things like the green berserker enemy type, way faster than every other enemy and way harder hitting. In fact, you see him about halfway through the game, the game's total progression, and he still remains one of the toughest enemy types in the game, e even once you get to the late game. I would say that the boss are generally cool, but um, they feel a little imbalanced as well. Either you are over leveled and they are way too easy or you're under leveled and they can one shot you and take a significant amount of time to work down. Very rarely did it feel like the boss fights when I came across them were perfectly balanced. And then also because this game has so much freedom of exploration and movement, which is great. This also means that you can cheese pretty much every single boss in the game. It's as simple as double jumping and using a ranged attack, be it magic or a bow. Usually you can just, just stand out of reach of the bosses and pluck away at their health. Um, pretty straightforward. I think it's cool when games have this system, but it also uh, feels unsatisfying if you do happen to engage in it. The other thing, like I mentioned earlier, is I think there are parts of the skill tree that should be pulled out of the skill tree and just be baseline. Specifically that double jump, I really feel like that should just be a baseline 
baseline ability. It's just a must have. It's almost like without question an ability that absolutely everyone in the game should have and not having it feels like you're at a severe disadvantage. Uh, there's a couple of other examples, but the double jump is a glaring one that I would say that should be baseline for everyone and replace that with just a more interesting stamina focused ability for people. Another point of criticism or I guess a wishful thinking thing is PVP. Uh, it's not in the game at all. Now the developers have stated it's something they may consider down the road and I seriously hope they do because this game feels like it would just be so satisfying to engage in PVP, especially with all of the character class variety that there is between the different weapons, the different specs and the different gear that you use. I just feel like PVP would be very, very fun if that's something they could consider down the road. I would absolutely love to see it. And then another uh, point that I want to bring up here is the fact that this game is incredibly story and narrative light. There is a main story quest. It's pretty much nothing but text. You're not going to be getting loads of dialogue or cutscenes in this game. I personally don't mind it, but I know some people will find this as a massive negative. So I did want to uh, bring that up. But even with these points of criticism, generally speaking, I just have really enjoyed Enshrouded. It has been an absolute blast. I can't wait to keep on playing. I'm actually going to leave the, the save that I currently have that I played through to do this review. And I'm going to start a brand new save once the game is officially uh, launching. And it is an early access release, but it launches this week. I'm going to start fresh and play with a bunch of my mates because it just it's going to be a lot of fun. I've, I've liked it so much. I'm happy to go through again. And I'm looking forward to continue playing. But there you go. That is going to do it for this video. Thank you so much, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.